Today I'm going to share what I pack when I travel to the Arctic to shoot landscapes and auroras. I get asked this a lot, so I decided it might be worth making a video to document my thoughts on this. My ideal packing list does change from trip to trip. I've done Arctic trips with lots of different cameras over the years, and my taste in lenses does change as much as my mood. So any advice here should be taken with a grain of salt. There are many ways to pack a good kit for your travels to the north. The short list of essential items I pack are an Aurora lens, a landscape wide angle, macro, telephoto, and a fast prime. Let's drill down into why each of those are on my list and what variations might be more useful than others. The two defining qualities of a good Aurora lens are that it's a very, very wide and very, very fast. Just how wide and how fast you decide will depend on your budget largely and how much gear you want to pack. For years I loved shooting Auroras with my Zeiss 15mm 2.8. That was my gold standard. We're talking about a manual focus lens that's very handy for night photography because it's easier to land the focus exactly where you need it. You have to keep in mind that with Auroras you're pushing everything to the limits because you're trying to reduce your exposure time. So the difference between f2.8 and f4 is double the exposure length or the alternative is to nudge your ISO beyond the practical limits for noise. F2.8 is where you want to be. But recently, I've got some new favorites. Sigma have a marvelous 14 to 24 millimeter F2.8, which is sharper and brighter than my old Zeiss lens. When I first bought this lens, I didn't realize it would be so great for auroras. I bought it for landscape work instead. But honestly, this lens has been magic for me. It's not a small lens compared to most mirrorless glass out there, but it's a superb quality lens and ideal for landscape use as well as auroras. Even better than 14 to 24 millimeter is the prime 14 millimeter F1.4, also from Sigma. It's a little heavier still and a little bigger, but a lot faster. You could be shooting at f1.4 or f2 and getting even faster exposures down to two seconds perhaps. That opens the door to some gorgeous time-lapse possibility or just really bright and rich images of the Aurora. I have to say also the vignetting on this lens is hard to find. I don't think there is any. This particular lens really is amazing and in the weeks to come I'm going to be posting a more detailed review on my YouTube channel. If your budget doesn't stretch to high-end glass like these Sigma models, don't worry too much. There are more affordable options that will still deliver a beautiful image, just maybe with a bit more vignetting. My favorite affordable is the 14mm f2.8 manual lens sold under the Rokinon and Samyang labels. This lens was designed for DSLR. You can adapt from EF to whatever mirrorless system you're currently using. They're great value. They also made a cinema version with T-stops instead of F-stops, and it's got massive big cogs on the focus and aperture rings. And these are great for working in sub-zero temperatures with your gloves on. Here's where that Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter delivers again. It's a really great lens for landscape photography, offering some flexibility for composition, but also has a hidden trick that you won't see on many comparable zooms. It's a tiny slot at the rear of the lens, which accepts especially designed ND filters, so you can slow down the sky or water for dramatic effect. I bought a set of Hyder ND filters to match the Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8, and mostly I use the six stop and 10 stop filters. And here's a plot twist on the other Aurora lens I mentioned earlier, the 14 millimeter prime. That lens also accepts the same rear filters. There are a lot of great 14 millimeter lenses on the market these days. Canon have a lovely 15 to 35 millimeter f2.8 zoom that is really great for Arctic landscapes. Sony also have their 12 to 24 millimeter f2.8 and that's definitely worth a look if you're on the Sony platform. For landscape work, you don't typically need a fast lens though. F4 is fine. But the advantage of any of these f2.8 zooms is that you can use them for auroras as well as landscapes. Tamron actually have a great little lens that's 17 to 28 millimeter f2.8. It's pretty compact and it takes 67 millimeter filters on the thread. You always want to think about the filters when picking a landscape lens. 
Many mirrorless systems now have slot-in rear filters when adapting from older DSLR lenses to your mirrorless mount. Please factor in the filters when picking your lens though. We don't often get out the ND filters to shoot landscapes, but for those moments when they do, they make a world of difference. Smoothing out the ocean at 10 seconds, for example, or getting the clouds streaking overhead, they're also great for time-lapse work. These elements can have impact on a scene, and so your ND filter is a good pit of kit to have in the bag. Until recently, I never traveled with the macro lens in my kit. At best, I would pack extension tubes, and then mostly I'm too lazy to go through the drama of using them. But last year, I got hold of the Sigma 105 f2.8 macro, and I just fell in love with that lens and the entire world of macro all over again. And then Lumix came out with their 100 millimeter f2.8 macro. That was even smaller and lighter, and the AF is super gorgeous fast. It's even better than my lovely Sigma macro, which is great if you shoot l melt, but the Sigma is great if you don't. My two main reasons for packing a macro for the Arctic are beaches and snow. 100 millimeter is a handy bit of telephoto sometimes for grabbing a snowy mountain or compressing a village scene. But mostly I want to use the macro as a macro. I want to walk along the shore and capture the ice where it's trapped some bubbles or purple urchins washed into the sand, or the texture of seaweed or lichen on a rock. These are relatively small lenses and they deliver immense joy. I highly recommend you pack a macro. We tend to think of telephoto as being about wildlife photography, but on my trips to the Arctic, we're not chasing much in the way of wildlife. It's just not that kind of a trip. We're doing landscapes, we're doing auroras. We often do see reindeer and moose and otters and eagles and such, but my tour is not designed around photographing them. We get glimpses of wildlife only, not the chance to do some dedicated photography for it. But your telephoto is useful for more than wildlife. Fishing boats heading out to sea or snowy mountain peaks, for example, can make for great subjects. If there's some pretty light at the end of the day, the snow being blown off a distant peak can make for beautiful detailed compositions. Something in the range of a 100 to 400 millimeter zoom is very, very good. You don't use this lens every day. You really won't. But for those few moments of magic, they really can add something special to your collection. I'm a big fan of including a few shots of texture in a series. So we match up both the big scene from a wide angle with detailed textures of the landscape or mountains. On a recent trip, I decided to travel light and instead of packing a telephoto zoom, I just used my 100 millimeter macro for those scenes instead. It worked very well most of the time, but the trade-off was occasionally that I really craved something longer to bring those distant peaks in a little closer. 100 to 400 for full frame sensors is a good working range. If weight is a major concern for you, then skipping the 400 millimeter in favor of something lighter and smaller might be the way to go. Just keep in mind, there will be moments when that longer reach would have been great. Seventy-five percent of my photography over the past three decades has been captured on 35 or 50 millimeter primes. These are very, very small lenses to pack and they deliver great results. I prefer a fast prime to a convenient zoom any day. I love shooting at f2 and pushing the bokeh. I also love having a modest camera in hand, so these modest sized primes suit me very well. Walking through a village to capture scenes of streets and cabins, I often find the 35mm perspective to be ideal. I used to lean towards 50mm more, but these days I tend to lean wider and wider, so the 35 gets my vote. The other advantage to many 35mm primes is that they're very close focusing. So even if you didn't pack your macro lens, you can still get some nice still life moments or some close-ups of things like seaweeds and urchins. 
For a plot twist, on my most recent trip to Norway, I used the Sigma 14mm f1.4 pushed wide open to capture landscape scenes, and I loved it. I know it sounds totally contrary to conventional landscape composition, but there are some magic moments to be had with very wide lenses shooting at f2 or faster. For example, there are some great 18mm f1.8 lenses on the market and a nifty 20mm f2 from Sigma to complement their 35mm f2. They're small, they're light, they're fast, and they're a lot of fun. If you've never shot with a fast prime before, I highly recommend you give it a go. I would start with the 35mm, either at f2 or faster, and if you're on the L mount, the Lumix f1.8 35mm is a peach. We don't leave home without it. Two considerations that span across this lens list are the challenge of carrying a full frame camera bag with all the gear and the weather conditions we experience in the Arctic. One thing anyone who lives up north will tell you is that Arctic weather is very, very unpredictable. It can be blizzards, windstorms, grey clouds, blue skies or even winter rain. You have to be prepared for anything in the Arctic. The two things that draw me to the Arctic especially are snow and winter light. I'm going to put auroras as the third because actually the snow and the low angle of the light are just really special to me. While we don't get great light all day and every day, we often get in time mornings or afternoons without any clouds and those are the moments we want to make the most of through the lens. So your camera kit needs to be ready for action when the light is on. Typically, that means having everything in one bag. You don't want a situation where some lenses are in the suitcase and you have to decide what to bring out for the day. You want to be ready to go when the light is good. So the challenge here is often weight. This has become a much bigger issue over the last decade as the mirrorless systems have pushed quality cameras to be lighter and smaller. And we have an expectation now that cameras should be lighter and smaller. And that includes the lenses. Even though I don't shoot with DSLR anymore, my camera bag is still heavy because I'm carrying more lenses instead of bigger cameras. The issue of weight comes up a lot with lenses like the Sigma 14 to 24 f2.8. You can get a lovely 18 mm 1.8 for a fraction of the weight. So why lug around 14 mm instead? My advice here is suck it up. It's a massive undertaking to fly across the globe and visit the Arctic. And why turn up with a lens that only reveals a fraction of the aurora? Pick the lens that will do the job properly and then decide how best to travel with that gear. Most of the time in winter, we're not walking very far. We usually can't walk far because everything is covered in snow. When we do walk through a village or along a beach, we have plenty of time and it's still a very small distance. We're not hiking the Matterhorn here. The biggest inconvenience for me is being in transit from Melbourne to Norway with all my camera gear. Air travel can really suck with my camera bag jam packed to the max and a laptop in there too. Even then, most other folks on these flights are carrying much more rubbish than I am. I just would advise to bring the lenses that will do the job. Don't compromise on that. Put quality first and comfort second. My final advice is to pack two camera bodies instead of just one. And please make sure they are matching bodies that use the same batteries and same sensor size. This is not merely a luxury, but a very practical, easy way to minimise lens changes in difficult weather. Plus, you ensure you have a backup in case of disaster. I will always have two camera bodies in my kit without fail. There's also another major benefit with carrying two camera bodies, and that's shooting auroras with two cameras at the same time. I like to have one rolling with time lapse and I capture very long sequences with like a 20 minute sky reduced to a 20 second video. So while one camera is shooting the time lapse, I can use the other to chase the action around the scene as it moves from one horizon to the other. Of course, this also means you need two tripods and two Aurora lenses. It's more money and more weight, but also more results. I find that double the camera bodies give me double the fun on these trips. It's a big ask for many people, yes, but I think it's really worth considering. That's my wrap of what to pack for the Arctic. We can't control the weather up north, but we can be ready for it. I have other videos here that might be useful to you as well, such as how to capture auroras and a longer chat about why two camera bodies are better than one. Have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you on a trip.